Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jérôme Paris from, uh, from INA. I will chair this session. First of all, um, I would like to introduce our two speakers. So we have uh, Andreas Klev, who is the CEO of Corti. And uh, we have uh, Itai, um, sorry, Itai, Itai Bengad, uh, who is the, the CEO of um, um, MDGO, yeah, sorry. So um, before we start and before I give the floor to Andreas, I would just give you a bit of, uh, of intro. Um, you have all heard about AI, uh, I'm sure. Uh, here what we want to do in this session is to show you how it can be used concretely for emergency services to improve uh, the response to citizens. Uh, so you're gonna have two concrete um, application of AI to, to our sector. And uh, maybe let's start with uh, Andreas. Uh, if you were here last year, uh, we announced uh, the start of, uh, of a project uh, using AI uh, to improve uh, the detection of cardiac arrest. Uh, and um, Andreas will present you uh, the outcomes of this project and a few, few more things. So Andreas, the floor is yours. Is this on? It's on. Hi guys. Uh, my name is Andreas Kleeb, as you said before, and I represent Cordy. And we have built an AI that works as a co-pilot for emergency dispatchers to arrive at the right conclusion faster. And that's our ethos, and that's what we really want to build on, a principle where AI and dispatchers work together. So first, I'd like to introduce our technology and where it lives. It's called the Orb, and I have a short video introducing you to how humans and AI can work together from today. At Cordy, we uh, developed a technology based on machine learning that is able to detect cardiac arrest based on historical data. We've created an algorithm that um, can listen in real time on the call, and when it detects that there's something wrong, such as a cardiac arrest, it will uh, alert the dispatcher on the screen. The challenge in regard to cardiac arrest is that from the collapse until resuscitation efforts is being initiated, the survival decreases about 10% per minute. We need all the help we can get in recognizing the cardiac arrest faster and more efficient. It's one thing to develop the technology and another thing altogether to get people to use it. Implementing new technology in healthcare always requires extreme consideration. People have reservations when it comes to AI. Popular culture has taught us to be wary or even fearful of intelligent machines. Open the five bay doors, please, Hal. We immediately saw that Tom's organic design, its simplicity, its dependability, could help overcome some of those reservations. I knew that we needed to, to to create an object that you would have sitting on your, your desk. And um, we needed both to communicate that the supercomputer was on, but also when, when light is reflected of these powder-coated matte white surfaces, you get a very warm, smooth, uh, very appealing feel. And I think it's quite important because usually when we create high tech, it's square, it's boxes, and it's hidden under the table. In a way, we, we put a benign spirit at the heart of this shade instead of, a, instead of a light bulb, which is what we usually do. So in that aspect, we, um, we are kind of creating a bottle to house the genie uh, for a greater cause. The orb is giving me a sense of uh, comfort and safety in finding the patient with the cardiac arrest uh, in those sometimes a little difficult calls. And uh, I think the orb is uh, lightened up a little in our black interior. 
we all have uh, admired uh, the design and uh, we were very surprised uh, that the function not was as a lamp to give some light but uh, it had some technology which was be, uh, going to be used in our daily work. It's a colleague uh, for us as well. So what is living inside the orb? We have built an AI that couples directly to the phone system or the phone on the desk, where it will, as a human, listen in on the call, the audio, as we process it. The difference is just that it has no intuition or empathy, but it has a perfect memory. So at this point, it has heard 10 million calls from different languages and different dialects with different problems describing the phenomenon that faces an emergency department every day. And here it has become exceptionally good at addressing the problems that face us during an emergency call. Within the first five seconds, it will know if it's Mandarin or Spanish, Portuguese or American, and it will help detect whether it's the right questions being asked, if the dispatcher should talk slower, or if it's a cardiac arrest or maybe a stroke that's facing us. This ultimately creates a situation where we can have this co-pilot, an assistant, something there that changes the paradigm from a situation where a dispatcher is alone facing the, the thing that happens to all of us the worst day of our lives, but now with a helping hand, a small assistant, that won't be better at doing it alone. It won't be doing it alone since it's there to help. What we saw ultimately was that we started working with, with Copenhagen and King County in Seattle was that not only is it immensely important to be accurate, so be able to detect the cardiac arrest fast, but it's increasingly important that we deliver it in the right way. So we chose specifically to work with Seattle and in Copenhagen since they are very, very fast already and very, very precise. So the idea was, could we take the learnings from these departments, some of the best in the world, and transport them around the world so an AI is more of a learning system? a parachute or a safety network that every dispatcher in the world could land on leveraging the learnings from these state-of-the-art best-in-class dispatchers. <clears throat> this led to the first research we started as we started discussing with Jerome what the potentials of, of AI could be in Copenhagen where the, the entire department said it to be a clinical trial which has been running for well over a year now. And the first paper came out in January from the emergency department uh, showing that we could improve the amount of detections quite dramatically. The first case was more than 90% of cardiac arrest calls could be caught by the AI and up to 25% faster on average. The latest shows that we can decrease the amount of undetected cardiac arrest with 36% from the moment of plug-in. So this is not about training in a new CAT system. This is about plugging in an orb and getting natural language as we communicate information directly on the dispatcher screen, showing them when to act. And then, of course, it's the dispatcher's choice to do it or not, since they are, of course, the pilot flying the plane. This ended with Copenhagen last summer uh, deciding to implement it. They both run emergency department with uh, 112, but also a nursing line of 72 seats where we're now focusing on building not only the cardiac arrest detections, the stroke detection, the brain hemorrhage detection, the opioid detection, and what else you can imagine us detecting, but also the right advice, the right questions, and the measures of criticality, which can then be used to a host of different support solutions, not only for emergency calls on, on medical side, but also on fire and police. So I've brought a, a, a small demo that's uh, 40 seconds that shows the insights of the program as we triage a call in Seattle. What you'll see is a two-sided interface. Left side here is a protocol where they run it in Seattle, and right side you'll see the AI detecting. Okay, address of the problem. Is there an apartment? It's a house. What's going on there? He doesn't seem to be breathing. Who's he? My husband. Okay, he, is he unconscious? <laughs> Evidently, yeah, I can't get any response. Okay, does he, and does he appear to be breathing normally? No, not at all. Okay, all right, how old is he? 
83. Okay, we're going to have to get him onto the ground and uh, attempt to do chest compressions, and I'll coach you how to do those, okay? I so what continues to happen here is that we not only within a 30 second gap detected it was a cardiac arrest based on what she described, how she was breathing, what noise we heard, but also the questions asked by the dispatchers. And that's the right side of the screen will help guide conversation but not lead it. And there we will detect stuff like whether or not the right questions were asked or the sentiment of the conversation, how it changes. And that's the interesting part of AI but also our task of communicating it since this is not a linear point of movement. We cannot say directly, because that word was used, that's a cardiac arrest, since the layers of these neural networks are very, very deep in the millions of parameters. What we can do is we can train it towards an outcome, and we can measure very precisely when it goes wrong, and we can, as humans, guide it towards more correct action. So we can control the recall, we can control the false positives. That means we can control how accurate do we want it, and how many times can we live with it over and under triaging. And I think that's a paradigm shifting potential we have right now for implementing this, since this gives us not only the chance to use the troves of calls that you might have at your call recording systems, to give the dispatchers taking calls today and tomorrow a new tool that won't dem demand that much new training, but will give them a whole new tool and a whole new perspective that will move them from sitting there alone to a perspective where they have all the knowledge of all the calls you have stored in your call recording system. So with Jerome, we decided to prove that this was not only uh, Seattle, Copenhagen. They're good. They've done this for years. They do research, but it could be much more. Sorry. So we, we set out an invitation for departments across Europe to join a test to prove that this is not something unique. We can all leverage AI. And the first two that we're un allowed and able to announce was uh, Samu in NSC who was very early on to join since they saw the, the potential of utilizing AI on an already very, very stellar operation. The second was Areo in Milan. <clears throat> and as you can see, we started early in Copenhagen, we started a bit later in Seattle, and we started very recently in these countries as we had to learn how to operate under GDPR. So what, what becomes interesting, of course, is all talk about AI and how AI learns. What we proved here in Copenhagen, with 8,484 hours, that's a lot of calls, that we were able to guarantee an improvement of detected cardiac arrest with 11% points. So they have about 1,200 a year. So we'll take 11% more of those 1,200 that we will detect. We will detect them in less than two minutes or at least 25% faster than their average detection. So that's more than 100 people that wouldn't have been detected. We see cases where patients are calling themselves and have not yet had the cardiac arrest. These are the kind of cases where every minute will add serious potential of survival. But that's a lot of hours. So in Seattle, we only see 450 hours, but we were able to prove the same thing. Then we combined the learnings of these two and started the project with Ina. And what we saw already with 93 hours in NSE is a 14% point increase in the potential of detecting cardiac arrest. And that's in French with dialects and all the troubles we can see, but it's becoming smarter. And that's the aggregate potential as we reach Milan that only recently started. They added six hours only right now, a lot more to come. They have added more, we're at six hours now, and we can see a 5% point increase. That's a massive amount of increased learning per hour of audio. We, we, we consume. So our goal here is to actually show you guys that it doesn't amount to thousands of hours of implementing and new schools of training and new software and new CAD systems. This is all about plugging a small lamp into your phone, finding the calls you already have stored in your call recording system and embedding it into the Cordy framework. And there you can see what I think also other interesting companies, as we'll hear in a moment, will be able to do for you. It will be able to liberate your data and give it back to the people who need it now. And this doesn't stop here, of course. Since as it learns about a cardiac arrest, it learns about component of criticality. It learns what the difference is between a call that is still critical. We still send the highest rate of ambulances, but it also isn't a cardiac arrest. So how can we now dispatch even better on brain hemorrhage, strokes, opioids, uh, important critical events in police, burglaries, hemorrhages, whatever it might be, domestic violence. 
that's the potential again of how these different incidents can again be transported as learnings across every location, but still keeping the data on premise, as all of this has been done with the potential of being on premise. Learnings during this, of course, was that we hit GDPR last summer. And GDPR, from a, a, a European perspective, is a forerunner in how we think about data. But it also kept us from moving at the pace we wanted, since we wanted to make sure we understood it correctly and moved in the right pace. And I think what we have learned from, uh, from actually working with different departments across Europe, both in legislation and in dispatch, is that it's very much possible to do these kinds of exercises just need to make sure we have the right framework in place from the operator's perspective. Since we will only see these proje projects become more and more data-driven and our everyday become more and more data-driven. But it is doable to do as long as the data operator in the GDPR uh, framework, so the, the, the PSAP, the owner of the data, has a very clear idea of how they are going to mitigate local uh, legislation versus European legislation and how they want the, the, the provider to live up to the standards of the GDPR. So how, what can you do on premise? What cannot happen on premise? What can move? What can't? And how do you want it operated, documented, and breach planned in the case of an emergency on the data side? On the other side, I think it's important as we as providers become much better at providing transparent data processing kits, which is something we've spent a lot of time with a lot of very expensive consultants working out to make sure we really have a right kit so you can get started and build on something as the department itself builds it, its own apparatus of, of GDPR documents. As we move ahead, we're going to announce more and more partners from the ENA Cordy partnership, and there's going to be much more results as these uh, data sets mature. But I think my overall message is that this is not about overwhelmingly big flow charts and processes and waterfalls. This isn't something we can do today. We can do it fast and we can do it with very little data, moving the needles on cases that today have very little chance of getting the help they need. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Um, do you have any question for Andreas uh, in the room? Hi, uh, Ira Cheromez uh, from ATOS and also in a committee. Um, my question is about the difficulties not only linked to GDPR but also uh, reluctance maybe from the point of view of emergency services to provide the sufficient data for the trials. So if there is more important problems than how do we increase survival rates on cardiac arrests, then those problems need to be addressed for before a project like this is, is, is in focus. I honest to God don't feel we meet a lot of reluctance, but there is other priorities. And as this progresses and we see more and more results, I think this will become, I think this will be in every one of your dispatch centers within the next five years, since we can move the needle massive amounts. But there are other things to prioritize, next gen one, one, two, and so on. And as these pro proje projects are implemented, I think we'll see more of it. I've done well Do, or good or bad. Answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Uh, I have a question for you, Andreas. Uh, I, I know the answer, but it's for the, the the room to understand maybe better how you. Um, you train your, uh, your AI, basically. So can you explain a bit um, which kind of data you need, how much data you need to, to make sure uh, your AI uh, is, uh, is really uh, able to, um, to, 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 to basically analyze uh, these goals? Great question. So first, it needs to understand the language. It takes six weeks to build a language. Uh, we understand English, Australian, American. We understand Italian, French, Swedish, and Danish. A new language would be six more weeks. And what we then do, we need 2,000 calls. And what we need is the audio file, and we need to know what you're looking for. So we need a certain amount of calls that are not about the topic you're looking for, a stroke, a gunshot, whatever it might be, and a certain amount we know contains what you're looking for, so a stroke or a brain hemorrhage or whatever it might be. 
Then we take these calls, put them into the machine learning, and let it retrain and retrain and retrain until we can provide a proof of concept that you can train and document and report. So we deliver a full report, the scope and the output, so you can go back to your organizations and, and document what has happened. I think that's important. Any machine learning company, in my mind, that don't publish or don't do PUCs or aren't transparent about their results, or at least how they get to them, I think is in serious doubt of, of not being able to deliver. Thank you. Um, last question from the, the audience. No? Thank you. Then uh, thank you, Andreas. Thank you. Uh, now we, I will give the, the floor to, to Itai. Uh, I met him actually in July uh, last year. He was quite warmly uh, recommended to me by our uh, president, uh, Demetri. Um, and uh, we'll you will understand why uh, in a few minutes. Um, what uh, Itai and MDGO have developed is quite impressive. Um, so, um, yeah, Itai, the, the floor is yours. All right, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, so, um, hi everyone, my name is uh, Itai. And uh, in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes, uh, I will talk uh, more specifically about technology and how AI disrupt new understanding of medicine. Um, this is a little bit about a company we uh, were founded uh, last year. Uh, have more than uh, 20 employees now, uh, FDA and CE qualified uh, with the first round of uh, fundraising of more than $7 million supported by car manufacturers and you will uh, very shortly understand why. Um, so when I was uh, my uh, sixth year as a med school uh, student, a friend of mine was involved in a crash and I was the one who saw him in the trauma unit and um, of course, it, he's, he has been brought to the trauma center and no one knew what he has. Uh, he was unconscious for the first few seconds, then he woke up. Yet, um, what are we looking at? Head injury, maybe a, a, a hematoma somewhere in his, uh, in his uh, abdomen, no one knows. So, reading a little bit about the, um, about the numbers, um, we today already know that the vast majority of car crash fatalities do not occur at the car crash scene itself, but only in the hours and days to come. And the reason is mostly not because it takes to the ambulance uh, a little bit more time because they don't know exactly where it happened because that already has been solved by the e-call. But the issue is that we have no idea what they suffer from. So we dispatch the wrong ambulance, we evacuate them to the wrong hospital, uh, we conduct a primary survey that lack many, many understandings and many data about what will happen in the uh, next few hours. And, uh, and this is exactly what we try to solve. The biggest problem is today when we approach a car crash is that we lack to understand anything. Statistical data has been there around for about 40 years that try to correlate between the intrusion into the vehicle and uh, the severity of injuries and things like that, but with no significant uh, success. The reason is because in the past about 15 years, vehicles have been built better. Uh, they do not collapse into the place where people are sitting anymore, but the amount of energy remains. That means that this energy is being transformed into something. So looking at a passenger that looks just like that, we no one knows if that abdomen is just fine or not. So we have to go through a city and go to have to go through a fast and so on and so forth. Um, and what is being required from us, just to have the understanding if this person should go to a level one trauma center or not, is nearly impossible to understand. Does he have a fractured femur? Does he have a fractured pelvis? Perhaps he has HPC, a hemorrhagic progression of contusion. How can we know that in real time at this scene? So, you can see that this abdomen, it might be look just fine, but he has a huge hematoma in his liver. This is, must go to a laparotomy operation right now. Or if you're looking at this head CT in real time, this is the first part, sorry, primary survey. This head CT looks just, looks just fine, but this is four hours later. So you can see that this person is already on the way, you know to a not very good place. The only way to see that now is to wait until someone will have neurological deficits and then to conduct another CT and to see that he has HPC. 
So what we've been doing in our company for the past year and almost a half is to utilize data which is already available in car manufacturers' clouds, some of the insurance companies' cloud, which is being transmitted in case of a car crash, which this is a three-axis accelerometer data. We take this data in real time. It takes about one second from a moment that a car crash collides into something or a vehicle collides into something until the data is being uploaded to the cloud. And then what we do, we process it. And this is what we do. We look at the car crash as every car crash has three different collision. Um, this is the first collision, all right? It's a vehicle that crashed into something. It could be an object, it could be another vehicle. The second collision is, and by the way, this is how we see that. This is a three-axis accelerometer output that every vehicle has and every new vehicle transmit this data into the car manufacturer's cloud, but nothing is being done with that. The second collision is the collision of the occupant with its environment. So if you think about it, all the chest injuries that people suffer from emerges from the chest seatbelt, almost everything. All the abdomen comes from the abdomen chest, uh, chest seatbelt. Uh, head restrainer causes head injuries, so on and so forth. And what you see here is practically the behavior of the head of this crash test dummy. Here specifically, it's a car crash test, and this represents the amount of force applied to the head of this driver, of this driver. So you can see it's a 25 Gs. The third collision, and the last one, it's the collision of the internal parts with whatever surrounds it. So it's the brain with the skull, it's the bowel with the abdominal wall, so on and so forth. What we do in our company, we utilize this three-axis accelerometer data in order to understand exactly what was the force applied to each one of the body organs during the crash. We deal only with, uh, with the organs which are femur, pelvis, abdomen, chest, neck, head, and spine. We do not deal with extremities as it's not very important in that case, of course. So what we actually do, we take this data which holds about 22 million variables, because this is the amount of variables that a car has when it crashes. And we just imitate whatever force is being applied to each one of those organs that I've talked about. So, sorry. So practically what AI allows us here to do, and that wasn't feasible four years ago or even three years ago, what it allows us to do is to look at the very, very, very complicated problem that were tried to be solved by maybe if we look at the car, we will understand better what happened to the occupant. Maybe if we'll know the delta V, we'll have a better understanding. But no, because this is in my head similar a little bit to uh, try to diagnose something with only one parameter. So you will tell me that you have fever and it's uh, 38.2 Celsius degrees and I will tell you what you've got. But that range from uh, tonsillitis to lymphoma, right? Millions of possibilities. So what happened when you take 22 million variables, so now we know that uh, the patient is 60 years old, we're going back to the fever, and he has 38.2, we know that he been tr has trouble to breathe in the past three days, he has sputum, he has an x-ray infiltration on his right lower lobe, and he has crepitation on auscultation. So now we know, all right, that's pneumonia but we needed more variables for that. This is exactly what we do here. We create, we allow AI engine, which if you're unfamiliar with that, that means that we create a machine that allows to create insights in real time that was never taught before. So we let the machine understand and teach us what is actually happened to the body during that time. We take all those millions of millions of variables and we show the machine thousands of thousands of cases in which we know how a car crash looks like and what's the three axis accelerometer looks like and what were the forces applied to each one of the body organs. And then of course we use biomechanic data that has been there in the past 40 years in order to conclude, so what is the injury? Because having the understanding that there has been 122 G on the X axis for four milliseconds on the head, 
means nothing to most of the people. But actually, the biomechanical research in the past 40 years today knows, they know it's a moderate traumatic brain injury. And you know, even in many cases, what is the kind of the injury itself. So what we do practically is we take this three-axis accelerometer and we build deep neural network for each one of the organs that you see here. So practically, we know what was the force, the momentum, the vector, the duration of each one of those things to each one of those body parts. So it also teaches us a lot about physiology and about pathophysiology. What happens when you apply 45 millimeters compression to the chest? For the first time, now we know that. We can, for the first time, have better biofidelity for crash test dummies because practically what we do, we transform each passenger in a car crash into a crash test dummy. So in terms of how it really happens is that when a vehicle crashes, it sends data to the car manufacturer's cloud. It has been there in some car manufacturers like Porsche since 2009. Some of them like Volvo since 2011. It depends on the car manufacturer. What we do in real time is we take this data, we process it in about seven seconds to create a medical report about the driver and the passenger at this time point that tells you exactly what, not if he's severely injured or not severely injured, but what is the AIS, the abbreviated injury scale for each one of those organs that I talked about. So perhaps if he has AIS-4 in his abdomen, but AIS-1 to his head, we're gonna have to evacuate to the closest or to the nearest hospital. But if he has AIS-3 or 4 in his abdomen, but AIS-4 in his head, so it's really meaningless if you're taking him to the nearest hospital if it's not a level one trauma center because no one will be able to treat this kind of injury. So as I told you, what we do is we measure the forces applied to the vehicle, we measure the forces applied to each one of those body organs, we translate it, use it biomechanical tools into actual injuries, and then we deliver this data. Um, I'm not sure how much time we have left. Yeah, we're good, all right. So I'll show you um, a little bit how the technology works in, in real life. This is, a, this is a car crash, as you can all see. And now I will show you what were the forces that have been applied to the crash test dummies. Here there are four uh, car crash dummies seats in every vehicle. And now you will see what were the forces applied to different body parts. So in the blue line, you see the actual measurements of forces that have been applied to the crash test dummies during the crash, sorry. On the orange one, you can see our prediction by utilizing nothing but this three axis accelerometer data that told us what was the force applied to each one of those body, uh, or which each one of those organs, I'm sorry. So taking this part, translating that using biomechanical tools into what it means allows us to understand, and we've done that very recently, that this occupant has nothing but a severe chest injury with a bilateral ch flail chest and a contusion to the lung. And that because we knew that he has 42 millimeters of chest deflection occurred only in three milliseconds during the crash. So it allows us also to differentiate different passengers in the vehicles. Now for the first time we are already able to understand why two different passengers sitting in the exact same vehicle suffer from such different injuries. This is because the amount of force applied to each one of those body organs that they have is very, very different. So looking at this driver involved in a crash, on the, you can think, well, it's been a 70 kilometers per hour frontal car crash, resulted in pretty much nothing because the amount of force that has been transmitted to the body was fairly minor. So yeah, he will have a, a minor concussion, which is uh, not that bad. But looking at the, the, another passenger, this person has maybe one hour to live. Maybe one hour and a half, I don't know. Because that, for the first time, allows us to have such an accurate understanding of those people involved in the exact same car crash, but the amount of forces applied to their body was so different. This guy has a severe chest injury, abdomen injury, has a head injury, and in a second you will see why. So this is this driver, okay? It really imitates a human body 
that is relevant to the ages between 15 and 65. This is the 50 percentile car, car crash test done. So, now you think about a, a real person sitting there, which this is exactly what it imitates. So it allows you now to understand, I, I won't show anymore. <laughs> Uh, so it allows you to understand how bad this is. What are those red numbers? And this is how it's being translated. A lot of force being applied in real time to several body um, organs here. And this is exactly what you see in real time using nothing but a three axis accelerometer and a lot of AI. So. In Israel, we uh, took this technology and uh, provided it to the Israeli EMS using a quarter million connected vehicles. We allow them to take their dispatching system, take their whatever they need into the next level. This is because, um, I have to say, this is not our business model. We don't sell that for EMSs. We just provide the data. So what we've done here is They've created, or actually they've asked us, I want to know when someone has this and that kind of injuries, what's the probability for that? And those are the cutoffs that I'm looking for. So if someone has more than 30% to have AIS-3, I'm going to send an ICU. If not, then no. All right, it's their decision. I just provide the ground truth, okay? So of course, that there is no human being intervention here. There is no phone call. There is nothing. There is car crash occurs. You count eight seconds. All the data appears for the EMS already. That's it. You don't need to wait to someone that try to explain to you what has happened. Everything is available in real time. So in the first seven months of uh, the pilot that we conducted with them, we had uh, 241 uh, car crashes uh, with the injury severity accuracy ranging between 75 to 87 uh, percent. That means that when we conduct a POC with a car manufacturer, which those are uh, our clients and insurance companies, what we do is we take a three-axis accelerometer data and we tell them what we believe that has happened to the occupants and then they tell us back what really happened. So that means that uh, it's not that we were right in 87% of the cases if, when we said severe injured or non-severe injured. We're talking about the actual AIS that has occurred. So if this passenger had AIS-4, and I thought it's AIS-5, that's, then I failed, all right? So this is 87% to be able to say AIS-4 in the chest, I know it's AIS-4 in the chest, not AIS-3 and not AIS-5. Um, so as I uh, described to you, what happens here in Israel is that we serve quarter of a million connected vehicles. Uh, when a car crash occurs, it takes about one second to the data to arrive to the, um, this telematics company's cloud, then we process it for about seven seconds, provide all the necessary data to the EMS, the ambulance is being dispatched automatically, I mean, choosing the right ambulance is being done automatically, the paramedics know in real time what should they expect for. Um, in the same time, once the EMS provides us data about where is he about to uh, evacuate the person, the people at the hospital receives data, or actually the physicians, using our app, which is very easy. Now they already know who's the person that they're about to see in 20 minutes, what they should look for, how the primary survey is about to look like, so on and so forth. So when we look at the value which is being added to the, uh, to the EMS, we believe that, of course, we have reduced the time to dispatch an ambulance from about three minutes from the moment a call is being done for about eight seconds. We've reduced the number of minutes until the first call is being done from about six minutes to one second. That will happen when you use automation and you use AI. So, um, so for the paramedic, we believe that there's a lot of value of providing the what you should and what you shouldn't look for, or maybe what you be more careful about. Uh, of course, this is a decision supportive tool, so we do not conclude anything and we do not tell no one how to treat and what to do. 
we just provide what are the probability for, uh, for what has actually happened. So in terms of uh, uh, unique challenges that we have as a company that try to connect mobility and, uh, and medicine is of course, first of all, is the connectivity of the vehicles. It becomes a, an emerging uh, um, uh, era of data connectivity. In 2022, 470 million vehicles will be connected. In Europe, there are dozens of million vehicles connected already. Um, so we believe that this kind of service will be available uh, in the upcoming year or two in the vast majority of the countries. In terms of data protection and the GDPR, it's important to understand that um, in the US market, data protection or HIPAA does not apply during a crash. Uh, which uh, is a life-saving or actually a life-threatening uh, event. But one way or another, we do not deal with, uh, with personal data. But of course, uh, we are complying to that. Um, and of course, another issue is the structural differences between EMSs and how this data could be delivered to the EMS. In Israel, we do it using their API, but how many EMS have their own API? The answer is, not many. Um, so the way we decided to solve that is we just provide the data to however they can consume it. Um, it shouldn't necessarily be integrated into their hardcore systems like they do it in Israel where the system already decides what kind of ambulance should be, uh, should be uh, used. But to use it as a, instead of having a subjective call from someone and having rough idea about what happened and then go to the scene and see a very different scenario than what you expected, now you can have all the data in front of you, even using a web interface. For us, it really doesn't matter. So I think that uh, the point that uh, we were trying to say that is that um, when so much data is available, we believe that this kind of data could get to anywhere to anyone that can just utilize the data. Because transmitting data today, even if you use a web interface, is, is not an issue, right? Um, so anyone could have those insights uh, from a car crash in real time. And of course, that the idea of utilizing AI to answer questions that we have no understanding of the answer. By the way, what you just saw is uh, we cannot really understand what happens there in the machine. We just take dozens of thousands of crashes and we see what actually results in the force supply to the occupants and then we let the machine understand that. We are lack of this understanding because this is like trying to take 22 million variables, try to guess the, uh, the actual variable for each one of those 22 million and then thinking about some kind of equation that will end up in a result. We have no idea how it really happened. Um, that's it. Um, thank you very much. And, um, thank you, Itai. Uh, so, do you have questions? Firstly, thank you very much for a very interesting set of presentations, both of you. Um, just on the, uh, the vehicle design, do you do any modeling around the vehicle to try and help improve the results between the, the three axis and the, the injuries? So it's a very good question. The answer is yes. Um, it being reflected under some circumstances in this three axis accelerometer data. So um, it pretty much provides the story about how the vehicle is designed to uh, act during some kind of uh, scenario. But yes, the, the vehicle type is indeed uh, affect that and it's take, being taken under consideration during the crash pulse. So you, you get a, like a normalized result that you analyze? Excuse me? Do you get a, like a normalized result? So the, the design of the vehicle has already been taken out of the data or? Yeah, 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 of course. So of course, you understand that um, Volvo, uh, brand new Volvo and BMW have a very different uh, um, features than a Kaya Picanto, all right? But that is being taken under the consideration because when a three-axis uh, data is being sent, it also say 
from what kind of vehicle it has been sent. So uh, you get the three axis accelerometer data uh, or the delta V for being measured in every 10 milliseconds or so. And it's a Volvo uh, S60 2018. This is a, every vehicle has that. It's the vehicle's IP. Um, also the VIN number if you're an insurance company. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Okay. No problem. Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you, Christoph Kautz. Um, I've got a question. So you get this data from the vehicle manufacturer. Um, they give this data to you for free or you have to pay them or is there a law in Israel which says the vehicle manufacturers have to give this data or how is this organized? Um, they, they pay me. <laughs> uh, because um, what we do with, their, with data is, first of all, we provide a life-saving service for their clients, which is the most important thing. Many car manufacturers have been trying to do similar things like BMW Assist, on call by Volvo, Ford seeing GM, OnStar, so on and so forth, have been trying to understand what happened to their clients when they crash. Um, so the answer is we, uh, we charge to utilize the data for that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So in, this, in Israel, it's a telematics company that, uh, that pay per vehicle, but our actual business model is related to insurance companies. So um, they pay not only to save life, which is amazing and it's great, and this is why I founded this company, but they pay to have the, uh, our insurance service, which practically automate claims. And this is where they get their money from. Um, was I answering the question? All right. But it's, it's a good question because this data is, of course, not available. Another question over there. All right. So uh, yeah, it all sounds very, very impressive. But there certainly, certainly must be like limitations to as to what you can do with with a three-axis accelerometer in a, in a vehicle, uh, like doing predictions on something so complex as the human body. Yeah, it's true. There are limitations, of course. Um, what we have done in the first year of developing, which is, uh, was only three months ago, the company has been founded at the beginning of last year. So our first aim was to focus on the 50 percentile because the 50 percentile is the 90% that are involved in car crashes. Those are people between the age of 18 to 65. Um, there are not many people that are involved in car crashes, which they are 85 or 90, and if you want to, um, to design a vehicle, you have to make sure it apply with the laws of the 50 percentile crash test dummy. So all the robust uh, uh, data that we have is based on a 50 percentile male and female. On the next generation, we will have the 5 percentile as well, men and women, which is every person which is not between 18 and 65 and is not between 165 centimeters to 195 centimeters and doesn't weigh between 60 kilograms to 100 kilograms, but weighs, I don't know, 180 kilograms or is very tall or is very short. But the first thing that we wanted to do is to provide the, uh, the results for 90% of people that have suffered injuries. For some injuries, it really doesn't matter who you are. If you apply 3,000 Newton on someone's abdomen, and it doesn't matter who he is, is going to have 120 millimeters compression. That result in a bowel perforation. That's it. If he's really, really tall or very, very short, it might be 110, might be 130, a bowel perforation will occur. It's also important to understand what are the differences. If you apply 400 Newton to the, to the vertebras uh, in, the, in the neck, that results in no injury. 500, no injuries. 600, no injuries. 700 starts, uh, you will have the first injury. That means that if you've measured 400, but actually 500 have been applied or 300, it really doesn't matter the result. 
Was I answering your question? Yeah, that was great. Thanks. Right. A last question, maybe? Yeah, I'm now thinking, looking at my uh, rights on firefighters, and maybe when the firefighters arrive to take people out of the car, that would that have s make sense to, to consider the movements uh, provided by firefighters in these calculations as well? We already do that. Um, we provide, uh, we will provide um, the probability for things like trapped uh, passengers because uh, on our insurance uh, uh, product, we provide uh, things like uh, the vehicle intrusion because they need that to estimate uh, the damage. But the vehicle intrusion also reflect the possibility for people being trapped in the vehicle. So that will be available. Um, and we're going to have that feature probably around July or so. We're not, uh, we're not out in the market yet, as you understand. I have a very last question for you, actually. When we met some months ago, uh, we had a discussion about the fact that basically um, the notification of the incident and all the data sent to the PSAP before they get the emergency call, the first emergency call. So how does it work, actually, at the end of the day? Because can, for instance, in Israel, can they dispatch emergency vehicles without having an emergency call? Yeah. The law in Israel, like in every other place, I think, in the world, requires a phone call in order to dispatch an ambulance. So we practically put them in a position which is fairly uncomfortable. They see that a car crash has occurred. They see that people suffer severe injuries. They know it is 87% to be right. So that means that worst case, it's moderate injuries and not severe injuries. And now they must decide if they will or will not act on it. So. Once I provided the data, my job here is done. And if they will choose not to act and wait five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, for a phone call, that's, uh, that's fine by me. That's, uh, I, I cannot uh, force anyone. In Israel, it was a very easy decision for them to, uh, to decide to dispatch the ambulances because we had a seven months pilot with 251 crashes that were correctly analyzed and when they've, because there are many things that they are lack. Like the, 70, the first 70 cases, uh, in 30% of the cases, they've dispatched ICU ambulance uh, to car crashes which had no injuries. In Israel, it's a governmental uh, thing, so no one's pays for that, but EMS, which are private, you pay three more times now for a service that you shouldn't, uh, you haven't given to no one. So, uh, so that allows us to utilize their, uh, their different type of ambulance as well, because once they've dispatched an ICU, they cannot use it for other things, meanwhile, in the next two hours or so. Um, so in Israel, it operates that way, but of course we don't force no one uh, to operate uh, that way. We just provide the data and we believe that it's the PSAP or the EMS uh, decision to decide what kind of uh, usage to be done with it. Thank you very much, Itai. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas. Uh, we can close the session right now. Uh, if you have uh, additional questions, feel free to, to go to them uh, after uh, this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.